All right, everybody. This is Dumb Ghost Hunters podcast uh, bringing on tonight. I'm very lucky because I got my teammate and good best friend Steve with me. And we're about to interview, you know, uh, Chris Fleming, uh, world-known psychic medium, um, you know, the host of Dead, uh, Dead Famous and uh, one of the biggest uh, known guy in the paranormal field right now. So, Chris, I'm very happy to have you on the podcast tonight. Oh, thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Steve. Hey. hey, so it's been a while, you know, we started talking about doing it about, a, you know, six months ago, and finally tonight it came, came through, you know, I'm very happy to have you on the show. Oh, no, thanks for sticking with it. I get uh, sidetracked all the time. <laughs> oh, my God, that's what we said, you know, there's so much stuff going on, you know, you're involved in so many things, it's incredible, but I wanted to start from the beginning, Chris, and, uh, you know, everybody knows you're a psychic, a medium, paranormal investigator, and, uh, but when did you start uh, learning about your gifts? Was it during your uh, early childhood or teenage years? Yeah, it was, it was definitely my childhood, and I never really used the term psychic too much growing up, or even in my teens years, I didn't, I didn't really like that term. Um... When I started having dreams that were coming true and started having sensations and feeling things before they would happen, my mom would tell me, oh, that's ESP. I'm like, what's ESP? You know, she says, oh, that's extrasensory perception. Because my mom grew up having dreams that would come true and sensing uh, events that was going to occur. So she basically told me what that was. You know, she says, oh, yeah, it's ESP. So I was going around telling kids, like, oh, yeah, I got ESP. <laughs> and they thought it was some type of disorder. <laughs> <laughs> some type of illness that I had, you know, at first, and no, that's the kid that's, you know, got ESP. But um, I used to, my mom read a lot. I mean, she would read books all the time, and she would, she would read a book in a night. She took, like, the speed reading course and everything, so she was, like, flipping through books. So I would go with her to the library, and I would pick out all these books on ESP. You know, I get the little library cards, and sometimes a librarian would help me, and, you know, I'd spend hours uh, just in the one aisle going through all the books, and then I'd walk out of there with a stack of books. I mean, literally, you couldn't even see my head. It was like the funniest thing. My mom's like, you don't have to take all those books right now. We can come back. And I'm like, no, I want them all now. So I would, you know, go home with these stacks of books, and I would just spend days going through them. I wouldn't really read them. I like to look at the pictures. But if I seen any pictures that interested me, I would uh, read about it, you know, and then read around it and start from there. I never really started from a book to, from the beginning to the end. I just was never that way. I would go in the middle of the book and, and, and jump around. But I learned a little bit about ESP, you know, experiments, and of course, like the spiritualist movement and stuff. And, you know, I was kind of disheartened by a, a lot of the uh, negativity and, and the fraud that was going on in the early 1900s. So it was kind of hard to actually learn from that or learn anything about it because there was a lot of uh, hoaxing and stuff that these books were actually written on. But it wasn't until uh, I remember because we started having ghosts in the house and things started happening. I started seeing ghosts and, and feeling ghosts. There was a, uh, uh, God, what was the name of it? It was a TV show that came on and, and it was like around 76, 77. And uh, I was watching TV with my mom and I showed a commercial for it. I'm like, oh, it was called uh, World of Amazing Psychic Phenomena. It was with Raymond Burr. And, uh, I said, oh, my God, can we watch this? He goes, well, you know, it's on late at night at 8 o'clock, and you're in bed because you got to go to school. I'm like, come on, let me watch it. So she let me stay up and watch it, and it was, I was hooked. I just realized, oh, my God, there's all this psychic stuff going on all over the world, you know, with mediums, and there's uh, there's ways to communicate with ghosts and spirits using real-to-real -real players, and, you know, and I was like, this is, this is for me. And when they showed this one segment where these people were talking uh, back and forth, these doctors, scientists about EVP, they're playing the real to real player, and then they show these people going out to a graveyard with a, a recorder and recording the voices. I'm like, that's it. I gotta get a recorder, I've gotta start recording the ghosts in my house, and then me getting involved in ITC began like in 1976, 77, um, and I started recording stuff around the house or at graveyards. That's great. That's absolutely amazing. And, uh, you know, your father was uh, Reggie Fleming, who was a good occupier. What? And uh, he, <laughs> and he actually played for the Montreal Canadiens, by the way. <laughs> I was looking at, uh, on Wikipedia and I was say, oh, my God, he played for the Rangers. He played for the Blackhawks. He played for uh, the Bruins. And uh, that's amazing, you know. Yeah, it was like 60, I think it was. Uh, he played for Montreal right yeah. around that. And, he, and then he went to the Blackhawks. 60 or 61, he got traded. Um, yeah, and then he won the Stanley Cup, you know, his rookie year at it, the Blackhawks. It's incredible because actually, you know, you're from uh, you're from from Chicago, so winning the Stanley Cup for your own town team, you know, must have been an amazing experience for him. Yeah, well, you know, of course, back in 61, 
Well, six three, I wasn't born yet, but that was great for my father. But of course, when we've won it the last two years, and especially the first time a couple of years ago, what was that 2010, I guess, uh, or nine or ten? That was just, you know, that meant so much because my dad had passed away in uh, uh, 2009 in the summer of 2009. So we won the cup, you know, that season. Uh, it was great uh, testament. I knew my dad was watching down from uh, uh, from heaven to, to to witness that that game. That's incredible because yeah, it, it, I got to tell you this. This is this is this is really cool. Is because the experience I had with after my father passed away, I had experiences with him, and I, I caught his voice on recordings on the spirit box. Um, I could sometimes feel him or sense him. You know, there'd be this intuition that would just come over me in his voice, and I knew it was my father. I could feel him. And when we were watching the, uh, the Blackhawks, I remember it was in the playoffs, and we were down like two nothing or something. I was at my computer, and my girlfriend at the time was watching the game, and I was working on something. She was, oh man, we're down. She's like, come on, we gotta win. And I'm like, oh, my dad just said that. Uh, Buford is going to do something, and we're, we're going to start pulling ahead. Next thing you know, Buford spills the puck, and he goes and scores, and, and it's like 2-1, to one, something like that. And the next thing you know, we wind up winning the game. And I start laughing. But the, the cool thing was, is the last game of the Stanley Cup, uh, we were at this bar, and I had the Stanley Cup replica that my dad got when he won the Stanley Cup, and I brought that with to the bar when we were watching the game. It's at the table. And, you know, it was just... You know, such a close game against Philadelphia. Just it's a nail biter, you know. And I think we were in overtime or whatever. As I can't remember, but I do remember. All of a sudden, I felt my dad says, "Son, watch this." And then Patrick King scored a winning goal. Yeah, and I and I and I nudged my girlfriend. I said, "My dad just says, watch this." So we're both looking at the screen. All of a sudden, you see Kane, you know, make a move here, here goes around, and then he flies around the net. And he's got his hands up. And we're like. What the heck just happened? Did, did we score? Wait, wait. <laughs> that was a weird yeah. ending. And, and that's when my dad said, watch this, right? And we won. And I looked at it. I go, oh, my God, my dad just told me to watch this. And we just won the game. And we're jumping up in the air. And it was it was incredible. It was just incredible. Not that we, you know, not only that we won the game, but it was incredible that my dad was obviously watching the game as well. <laughs> that's, you know, I got goosebumps, you know. I, I, I still remember, remember that game because I'm a big hockey fan. And uh, my favorite team, besides the Montreal Canadiens, is the Black. Cox, and uh, I, I'm a big fan of Jonathan Taze and Patrick Kane, and uh, I still remember because the, the goal was awkward. Nobody but him knew he had scored. <laughs> yeah, everybody's looking at one another. Did that thing go in? You know, because you didn't see it bounce off of anything. It just got stuck and disappeared. Uh, but yeah, what, what a what a great a great thing. And you know, I knew my dad up there was was celebrating as well. Exactly, and uh, you know, Chris, you know, it was very emotional because I watched on YouTube uh, not too long ago the documentary that you did uh, with your dad. You know, in the last years of his life. And uh, I know that him being a hockey player, he must have been on the road a lot. And uh, to, for you to be able to spend time with him must have been, uh, you know, uh, a blessing, you know, the last years before. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Is, is you know, the thing that um, I was very fortunate in, in the passing, uh, or my father getting sick. And when I say fortunate, I'm not saying fortunate because he got sick. But fortunate that, um, you know, he had a stroke and heart attack. And he was basically bedridden because he was uh, paralyzed. Uh, his body wasn't able to move or get up. He could only move his arm, uh, and then his other arm is slowly that all deteriorated. But no, he could speak, you know, and he could, we could have conversations. So those five years that he was bedridden and, and slowly deteriorated, you know, we got to spend time together. You know, my dad wasn't going anywhere. He was in the bed, and we got to sit there and talk about everything. So uh, imagine, you know, seven years prior to that event, you know, not talking to your father. We, we didn't talk for seven years. We had a big falling out. Mm -hmm. And then there was another time years before that for three years we didn't talk. So there's ten, ten years I didn't talk to my dad at all. We both were very stubborn, and, you know, and it's not really even important at this time. But we just, we didn't talk to each other. You know, we got a big fight. And, but when this happened, I realized, no way, you know, I, I can't live with my father, you know, passing away and us not communicating. So we spent those five years talking about everything. You know, there was no regrets, no, uh, nothing to worry about. We, I told him about heaven and everything and what it's like, you know, the soul and spirit. And I remember I said to my dad, I, I think I even recorded it too. I said, Dad, do you don't want to know what it's like to be out of your body? Do you want to know what heaven's like? And he says, yeah, sure. You know, so I told him, and he says, well, I hope so. And I said, Dad, you know, if anything ever, ever happens, you know, you got to talk to me. You know, you got to speak to me and stuff. And he says, I will, you know, so, and he did, which was great. But the important thing was, is what I did was, you know, seeing my father uh, in bed and stuff like that, and, you know, a lot of people didn't know, and I, I wanted to document it. There was something deep inside me that says, you know, I need to document this. And I, what I documented was him telling some of his stories. 
when he played hockey. It was a, a way for him to still get out there in the world and, and, and talk to people and communicate with people, you know, based on social media. So I filmed a lot of the conversations and a lot of stuff I still have I never put up, you know. But uh, I would edit them down to just like eight minutes, five, eight minutes, and I would put those clips up online. They're all on YouTube. Uh, you can just Google Reggie Fleming interviews. There's actually nine of them, uh, eight of them uh, I did when he was alive, and the ninth one I did after he passed away. But we would just have conversations, talk about the moments that meant to him and what he liked about playing hockey and this and that. My favorite one, of course, which is evident, is, is the eighth one because I laid in bed with him uh, while we talked and filmed it. And then we watched one of his hockey fights and we kind of had some humorous moments there as we discussed it. Mm-hmm. To me, that's just, you know, it's amazing. The purpose of this was twofold. One was to give my father the opportunity to have a voice and people to see what's going on with them. The second thing was to inspire people out there that, you know, when you have a loved one that's sick or in the hospital, um, you can turn that into something. It's a very special moment. And it's a special moment where you really need to open up, uh, let bygones be bygones, talk about life, also talk about death and the afterlife, and just really get as close as possible to them to understand them and understand you so that when they do go, there's no pages left unread, you know, uh, no stones unturned. Uh, you've, you've discussed and covered everything so that when you know they cross over to the other side when they, when they pass away, it's, it's more of a celebration that they've earned it. it. It's time for them to go home. And that's how it was, you know, for my father. Because we talked about, it. So, you know, I could die any day. And I'm like, you know, what do you want me to do for your eulogy and this and that? And we talked about a lot of things. So when he did pass, uh, I, was, I was prepared for it, you know. So it was, it was, uh, it was an incredible experience to take with and then inspire other people and to share with other people. It, it, it is. It is because, you know, a lot of people can relate to that, you know, uh, you know, father and son relationships. I don't know why, but most of the time they're not very easy. And I, I think the older we get, sometimes the more we realize that, you know, we're really missing out on something because, you know, we only have one father, you know, whether we agree with what he does or with yeah. what. And I didn't agree with a lot of things he said, you know, but he, he, still, you know, he used to always say to me, he goes, you know, one day you're going to understand when you're going to, you know, and I do, I do understand now that I'm older, things are perspectives, perspectives and things are a lot different when you're older compared to when you're growing up, you don't see the things and then you realize the realities of both parents, you know, because my parents got divorced when I was in sixth grade, you realize really other things that were going on uh, when you get older, when you begin to see things, and because, I'm a, because I'm a lot like my father, I'm able to see things as the way he saw things now, you know, it's as if I'm in his shoes, so that actually, you know, really means a lot, but the nice thing was that uh, it kind of forced him to talk about this too because of the situation, you know, being there, not being able to move or, or go anywhere, you know, all that you had really had left was conversation, you know, and time sharing with one another, but the one thing I admire more than anything, and I, I don't, I really don't know how he did it, because my dad used to, I won't say my dad complained about a lot of things growing up, he used to bitch about things, and I thought, if anything ever happened to him, and I used to tell him growing up, I said, dad, you're going to end up in a hospital, you're going to end up sick because you don't take care of yourself, because he used to overeat and all this stuff, you know, he gained a lot of weight. I said, you're going to end up in a hospital, and, you know, you're going to be just live in a hospital. That's how you're going to end your days. And sure enough, he did, and I felt kind of bad that I, I prophesied that. But I always thought he'd be a grumpy old man, you know, just miserable, and just would be negative about everything. <clears throat> and that wasn't the case. Um, he never complained, uh, not even once. Um, it, it, it was unbelievable. I, I literally could not understand how someone could be in a bed for five years, not able to move, not able to brush their teeth, feed themselves, wipe themselves, not able to go outside on the beach, you know, to do all these things. And he never complained. And I used to, I used to say it to him, I walk up, you don't complain, this thing, there's, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, if God wants me to be here, that's where I am. You know, I'm just like, oh, I would have complained. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. I'm sorry. I would have complained, you that's, know, but he didn't. And that just shows you how strong he really was. Exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, I remember you uh, in Gettysburg when you were telling us this story. And uh, I was very emotional because I, like I said, you know, we can all relate to uh, to this. And um, then, you know, growing up, so, you, you, you know, your dad was on the road a lot and everything, you know, your parents were separated. And when did you um, start, you know, using your gifts more and learning to uh, channel your uh, your gifts to uh, actually make a living out of it? Make a living out of it? Well, it's, you know, it's not easy to make a living out of this at all. Um, I mean, you don't get paid for 
a lot of the things that you do. That's true. And I mean, it's nice to go speak. You know, I get speak. I get paid for speaking, which is great. And I love speaking. I'm a professional speaker. Um, having all these years of experience, I've got the knowledge and background to go up there and discuss about many different topics based on how it's related to my life and how it's important to the populace and what's going on today in the field. That, of course, I do get paid for. You know, but that doesn't support everything. You know, it doesn't pay all the bills. Um, you know, I do readings and consultations, but I cut back the past couple of years because a lot of things I've been going through. Plus, it's more like I, I don't want to be someone that just does readings five, six days a week, you know, and just tries to fill in as many readings as I can and just make money that way. I just, I don't like doing that, you know. The only reason why I do charge is because I do need to pay some bills and whatever readings come in, I have to charge because I, I can't denote that time or, or, or open up that time for somebody you know, unless I'm going to be compensated for it, you know. But I do help out people and deal with cases uh, with children or with families here and there, whatever I can fit in with my time, um, and I don't charge at all. You know, I've worked with doctors and, and psychologists and psychiatrists that have had certain clients that doesn't fit the, the protocol or whatever they uh, would label as any type of disorder, um, and they begin to realize that it's something supernatural or spiritual. So they've, I've received calls from hospitals and doctors in Chicago to come assist them, which I feel very grateful, you know, and I respect what they do. And it's, it's interesting in doing this, and I can't talk about the specific cases because it's something, you know, personal for these people, but it's really nice to have uh, the respect, and it's something that, that I earn. I just don't go in there and expect the respect. I, I respect the person first, such as some of these doctors and psychiatrists that have, have contacted me through people they know somebody and someone tells them well you gotta call this guy whatever and uh i'll either call them on the phone or i'll go meet with them and i don't even say anything what i do yet i said i want to know what they do how they work you know if the person's on any medications this and that and what is their you know what do they believe they're suffering from this and that and i want to hear their side of it because they spent all that time with that person for, for whether it's for six months or for years so i really want to know what their diagnosis is and then after that, I said, okay, what are the things that don't fit that diagnosis that you've noticed, the things that you just, you just can't explain and you're just, you know, rubbing your forehead going, oh, my God, what's going on here? You know, and so they will explain that to me, and I'll be like, okay. And then I will sometimes question them, well, could I be caused by this, this, and this? And they're like, no, no, no. I said, okay. All right, well, let me, you know, meet with them. You know, and then I'll talk to the parents first or whoever. And then uh, I like to have uh, a parent or, or a relative there. Um, and I do record it. I said, I'm recording this not to ever play this, but I'm recording this for many different reasons, just in case something happens, you know, to have a legal document of it. But it could last, you know, and it's always different. But it, it's, it's amazing. Um, and I say this, it's not, you know, you go through life and you have all these experiences. You have experiences with ghosts, you have experiences with demons, you have experiences with angels and divine intervention and miracles and all these other things that happen in your life, that happen in my life. And I think it's all prepared me for certain things. But when I go to a certain case where I have to meet with somebody, um, and it's all been pre-planned for me to meet with them and everything, we've gone through all the paperwork and everything, and I sit down with them, I don't go in there with a certain protocol or an outline of what I'm going to do. Um, there's a preliminary thing in asking a few questions, but I just let the Spirit tell me what to do. You know, when you talk about the Holy Spirit, is I said, I just say, God, tell me what I need to do. What do you want me to do? And I follow that. And I don't go in there with any fear or trepidation or assumptions. I just go in there and I have him tell me exactly what I have to do. And it always works. It always works. Because I know I'm not the one that is really doing all this work. I mean, I've been prepared for this and that to feel comfortable and not be afraid of doing this type of work. You know, and be knowledgeable, experienced, you know, and to have that type of respect and reputation to be able to get into these situations to help people. But when it comes down to completely understanding what's going on with the person and, you know, what type of entity or spirits attached to them or affected them, we're talking about observing from a completely different dimension. We're talking from observing from spirit. And the only way I can actually do that is not some, you know, amazing, powerful ability that I have. No, not at all. Not at all. It is actually the spirit telling me, you know, the Holy Spirit working through me or telling me exactly what's going on. And how do they tell me? Well, they tell me not just like the voices in my head that say stuff, but I begin to feel it and experience it as if I am that person who's gone through this as well, as if I'm in their shoes and experiencing it. And the only way I can, the only thing I can relate that to is when you talk about the soul on the other side in heaven, how everybody's connected, is the soul and spirit and consciousness is all connected to one another, that everybody can relate to one another because there's no such thing as lying because everybody knows what everybody's thinking on the other side. When I say the other side, I say in heaven. There's still many 
these secrets and stuff with spirits that are trapped and confused here. But on the other side, everything is open, and they share things amongst one another. And to get to know another person, one soul, another spirit will kind of cross through each other, become one, and they will know exactly what that person's gone through, how they feel and reacted, and the conglomerate, the, the combination of all their lives that they've had. So I, I don't know the exact term of what to call that, but in, in this non-local type of communication that's coming from somewhere else, and communicating with me and then downloading that information or, or allowing me to feel and experience that information in front of that person, it gives me the opportunity to then take that and use that to assist that person and to get a better understanding, which a psychologist and some other counselor can't because they're not able to communicate with the spirit. They're not able to see these things and experience the emotions and feelings. All they're going from is basically their own intuition, but mostly from what they've learned from school and their degree certain protocol that they have and how they have to make a diagnosis and they fit this certain category and if it doesn't fit they try to force fit it into something and if it doesn't fit it keeps bouncing out of that category they realize that there's something else going on it's and true. I guess that where it kind of assists them in coming to a diagnosis or realizing okay we do have a spirit that's affecting them whether it's a possession or some other type of thing and then we we resolve it and I'll never forget this one uh, a psychiatrist at the hospital said to me goes, well how do you Okay, so this person's possessed, which is obvious. The police held her down and all this other stuff. She was speaking in a different voice, and she's not on drugs. Or everything else is fine in her, in her chemical balance in her body. Uh, so how do you get rid of it? And I said, well, I have to communicate with the soul and spirit that's attached itself to her. No different than you communicate with somebody to find out their deepest problems or whatever is in their subconscious that they're acting upon. And they're like, wow. So it's just like, doing, yeah, but I'm doing it with spirit rather than a... a, a a physical person I'm doing with the spirit that's attached to them. So it can be, it can be complicated at times, but usually it's, it's not when you have something else kind of guiding you and telling you what to do. So I don't really think of it. And when it's done, I just leave because I, you know, I can't figure it out. Try to figure out, wow, how did that happen? I just, just leave. It's not really much for me to know exactly how it happened. Just the fact that it did. That's incredible. And, uh, you know, we got a question from Glenn on Twitter asking you, Chris, uh, what, what made you decide to start helping kids, you know, learn about and develop their gifts uh, on, on the show Psychic Kids, you know? I guess the thing is, you know, growing up and stuff, because I was seeing ghosts and I grew up in a haunted house and I was all alone with this. I didn't really have anybody else to talk to except, you know, one or two of my neighbors saw a ghost and, and that was it. But they weren't getting dreams that were coming true and, uh, you know, reading people and stuff like that when they go to grade school and and get forewarnings or foreshadowing of things to come. So it was uh, it was difficult because my mom would always be like, keep it yourself, keep quiet, you know, and I couldn't really relate and talk to anybody about it, even though I would, and I'd get in trouble for doing that. But as I got older and started meeting kids in high school or college or whatever else, people that would have experiences, you know, there'd be a few here and there, I would tell them, oh, I went through that too, and I would kind of give them advice and stuff and how I dealt with it. But... Um, you know, when I started doing uh, Dead Famous, you know, I was investigating in the 90s, and I would investigate certain houses and stuff in the city of Chicago and go to some of the graveyards, and I was really into the ITC and just getting, you know, evidence and documentation. I wasn't doing too much uh, counseling or consulting at that point. It's not like I had built up a reputation doing that at the time anyway. It was stuff that was more personal, kept to the self. But when media started coming out in 2000, you know, I, when I published the magazine, because I've been publishing the magazine, talking my experiences and interviewing people all over the world, um... You know, the credibility started to build, like, wow, this person's got a background with this stuff. This guy's going out there and talking to people all over the world about various paranormal experiences. You know, he's doing like, anywhere from 100 to 200 radio shows a year. You know, I would literally do, like, 10 radio shows a day during October. It was crazy. Um, and I enjoyed doing it. I would just take a couple weeks off and just do radio shows every day, you know, around Halloween time and just talk about ghosts and different things. But it was really, like, when I started doing Dead Famous, you know, I started getting access to other things I, I didn't get access to before, such as some of the most haunted locations and then working with some of the experts, you know, like uh, Lloyd Aubuck and Pamela Heath and Dr. Barry Taff and working with them. And these are people that have spent their life dedicating some of the science and the research and psychology or parapsychology that's involved with this type of phenomena. So now aligning myself with these type of people and not only sharing my experiences to, to add to their data and their, their uh, information, but also to learn from them. Uh, from how it was being looked at from the scientific community or the parapsychology community. Uh, I learned a lot because I had never had that around me in my circle. So that helped a lot. 
you know, I remember when uh, Psychic Kids came out, I was like, oh, God, I would love to do that show, you know? God, I should be doing that show. I wish I was doing that show, you know? Because that's me. That's what I went through. And it's just funny how fate tends to hear what you're saying or, or guide you. Because I had a meeting with uh, A&A. We were pitching a show to them, a show idea that I had. And I remember talking to the uh, VP of development, and she was telling me, she's like, well, what's your background in this? You know, and I started telling her, she's like, oh, my God, she goes, you'd be perfect for psychic kids. And she's like, you know, the second season, you know, the first season did well. She's like, but we want to try some things differently in the second season. So we want to bring a couple other psychics in to, uh, to meet with the children and work with the children. I said, really? I said, okay. She's would you be interested in doing an episode? And I'm like, yeah, definitely. You know? And it was funny because... Uh, yeah, I'm just going to say this, I don't care, it's the truth, is um, I had an opportunity to go to the Playboy Mansion for a party. <laughs> <laughs> and I, seriously, it was a, uh, it was like a summer party, I don't know if it was one of those theme parties that they had, you know, a friend of mine said, hey, you want to go with, and he's, he's a plastic surgeon out in LA, and I said, oh my God, I'm going, you know, I'm going, and then A&E contacts me, said, hey, we're going to film this weekend, and I'm like, this one weekend, I'm just like, oh, that's the same time I'm going to the Playboy Mansion, so I had a decision to make, do I want to shoot this psychic kids episode or do I want to go to the Playboy Mansion to like this uh, costume type party and it was obvious you know I said okay what's really important you know what's important is I'm going to help these kids I'm going to do something not that I go out and party in LA you know the lifestyle of Los Angeles I go you know that's doesn't really help people you know and there's there's obviously a, a negative influence there somehow <laughs> <laughs> I said so no I'm going to do the psychic kids episode and I did you know and I'm so glad I, I did um, that first episode was just remarkable. That was the ghost school episode where, where I broke down crying because both the kids were started tearing up because the father was arguing with Colt. And, uh, you know, the kid just wanted to be heard. He wanted his dad to believe him. He wanted to know this is real. I'm not making this up. And, you know, his father, Merrill, was kind of, you know, not yelling at him. But he says, you know what, this is just, I don't believe in this stuff, this and that. And, and I could see Colt holding it in, trying not to cry. And then I saw Bryson start tearing up because it was the same thing he was dealing with with his father. And all of a sudden, here I am just falling backwards into time to my childhood. Of, oh, my God, it's the same thing I went through with my father. And not only was I emotions from my childhood coming up, which I'd never been in a situation before like this, and here I am thrown into the situation. I'm supposed to be the teacher. Um, I'm also feeling, as an empath, feeling the emotion of both these children. And because they're holding it in, I'm feeling my own, and I'm feeling both of them. There's just, I was just ready to explode with emotions. I just couldn't stop, and, and I did. And I broke down, you know, and he was holding me. He didn't get to see it. And I said, listen to me. And I said, uh, I'm not going to apologize right now for breaking down. Because if I was to apologize, that means that there's something wrong and that everything that happened to me, there's, there's uh, you know, I need to apologize for that, and I shouldn't. Neither one of these kids should apologize for the experiences that they're having. And then I went off and I started telling him that this is real, you really need to believe him. And uh, it was a turning point for the series, uh, I believe. And, and I know that um, some of the executives from AD contacted me and they told me that, you know, oh my God, you know, you really built rapport with these kids. You you got it. You you knew what these kids were going through. Of course, you know, like, it, you know, talking to Chip and nothing against him, he did a great job on the show. You know, he didn't grow up with a lot of these things. He didn't grow up with a lot of these experiences and having these things happen. So for him, it wasn't, uh, he didn't understand a lot of that. So, but I did, and, and that was the thing they were looking for, and it, it worked, you know, in that episode. I was really able to bond with both of these kids. And then afterwards, the, and plus we got all these other ghost things. They were seeing ghosts, and, and the father saw ghosts and stuff, and a lot of stuff he didn't really get to see in the show. But there's all these other things that happened that was just remarkable. You know, and unfortunately, a lot of the evidence they didn't put in the show because it was more about the, the kids' psychic abilities rather than the evidence we were getting to support it, such as a lot of the EVPs and stuff that was caught on camera. But uh, the director was like, oh, my God, we want to have you for another episode. So they brought me out for another episode, and I did two for the th second season and then three for the third season. Those, out of all the things I've done, uh, because that really meant so much to me because I've lived that, and we didn't have this when I was a kid, to be there and help those kids and those families was probably the greatest thing I've ever been a part of. There's no doubt about it because here's people understand. I mean, this was unlike any other reality show I've done before where it was a workshop all weekend. And what it was is Edie and I would sit down and we'd discuss the kids and the families, what we believed was either wrong with them or believed was going on. 
And we decided, you know, no one told us what to do. We just, we both decided how we wanted to approach these families and these kids. Edie would give me advice, I would give her advice. And she's like, how should I talk to this one, the mother? And I go, well, I'm getting from the mother is this, this, this. You need to ask these questions. And sometimes Edie would tell me, and I would tell her, can I ask this, can I ask that? She was like, no, you can't ask that. You're not licensed. I said, okay, then you do it or you be there with me. You know, she could, if she was there, I could, I could ask those certain questions because she's licensed. So it was, it was incredible. You know, we'd spend four or five days with this family from morning till night, and they would just document it. I mean, there's so much footage nobody got to see. There was the breakdowns, the emotions. The, the kids would yell at times at the mom and father, and, and, and that they would say, I quit, I'm not doing this, because they were upset that their mother or father was upset. And, and it, was, it was amazing. It was just so, it was like a family, and that was the thing. And when we were done by the end of the episode, um, we all understood each other, and we were all so close together. It was like our lives, all of our lives were changed. I mean, not only were these kids and the family's lives changed for the better, but um, our lives were changed, too, because we took things that happened in our childhood and we were able to put it to good use. And I think that was what was the amazing part about the show. Now, of course, they edited and stuff to make it look scary and this and that, but besides that, you know, the people that were there and the families that were there, they know exactly what, what went on, you know, behind the camera, and even when the camera wasn't rolling, and it was all for the cause of four to five days as a workshop. Exactly, and Chris, you know, I remember in Gettysburg uh, when we investigated Tilly Pierce House together uh, with a bunch of people. You know, uh, you telling me about um, when you were doing that famous and the producers. You uh, you were investigating. Uh, I think it was Elvis' uh, childhood home where you lived when he was a kid. And uh, I want you to tell me uh, the thing that you told them. It turned out to be true in a picture, if I remember, about peaches. Oh, so freaking cool! <laughs> Yeah, it's because, like, the director's, like, um, or producer's, like, you know, this is, she, she loves Elvis and everything. She's like, you know, this is really important. You got to see what you can find. I said, okay, so I go in the, the bedroom. I'm sitting with the cameraman, and I'm getting these images in my head. I'm like, okay, wow, I'm, I'm seeing a, a younger Elvis, and he's got a white T-shirt on. And I see him coming towards me holding these bushel of corn, like a whole bunch of corn stalks. I saw these corn stalks and corn in his, in his arms. And then it kept playing over and over like a loop. And I was like, why am I seeing this? And, and the cameraman's kind of laughing. I'm laughing, too. And there's some other things I got, too, which they edited out, which, which was kind of funny. But they, they were related. But the course, like, I'm like, I can't get this out of my head. And he's like, why can't you get it out of your head? You know, and then I would, and I said, well, I can't. He was like, no, don't talk to me. Just, you know, say on camera, why can't you get it out of your head? You know, and, I, and I'm saying, I can't get it out of my head. I go, I can't take this anymore. So I got up and I, I walked into the kitchen and I asked the, uh, the owners of the house. I said, you know. I'm just getting this thing. I keep seeing Elvis with corn, you know, like he's bringing it to his mom or whatever. And what, what does that mean? And they're like, oh, my God. You know, and then they, they whip out this photograph, a black and white photograph of the backyard. And um, they said that a neighbor or somebody, a relative or whatever, had come over one time to take a look at the house and was going through all this stuff and telling them stories. She goes, about this photograph, you see the corn stalks at the, at the corner? You, you can see these corn stalks in the upper left-hand corner of this photograph. And then you see the pool and you see the backyard, right? Most people look at it, they wouldn't even notice it unless someone pointed it out. And she goes, see this right here? I go, yeah. She goes, that's corn stalks. I'm like, oh, my God. She, I go, okay, so there's corn stalks. Is that why I saw? I go, that doesn't seem relevant. She goes, no. The relative that came over, the neighbor, whatever, told her that, that the mother used to tell him to go out there and pick the corn all the time. Elvis would go pick the corn a couple times a week and bring it in for his mother to, to cook corn. And I'm like, oh, my God. Well, I'm in his room. So imagine you're in your room and your mother says, you know, Elvis, will you go outside and get some corn? So he's laying in his bed. And he's like, okay. So he goes outside and gets the corn and brings it in. And, and so I was jumping up and down because I was so excited because the producer was putting so much pressure on me to, like, you know, you've got to get something about Elvis. This is so important. This is going to be huge. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, and I'm getting all these different things. And, and just the corn thing was great. You know, and it, some people might seem like, well, who cares? You know, well, yeah, but who cares? But it, it, it was something I got, you know? Exactly. It, cool. it, it, it is cool. It is cool. And, and your show went on for three years, so you've done a lot of um, very cool uh, investigations. And one that I, I really liked was Billy the Kid, because I'm a big Billy the Kid fan. It was fan. my favorite. It was so awesome. It, it was your favorite? It was, well, one of my favorite was uh, the uh, Jim Morrison, What Happened at the Whaley House, was just insane. I mean, the director getting shoved by the stairs, you know, the, the, the uh, recorder getting ripped out of my hand and, and all this other stuff. But um, Billy the Kid was amazing because there's a whole another thing that happened that the producer and director um, took out of the show because it had to do with Gail. 
and it was really on borderline uh, dealing with some sensitive issues. And all I can say is, for those that know, if they if Google Gail, Gail had some breakdowns, uh, and she had some, she was hospitalized a few times and stuff. This was right around the third season, uh, this, the summer before the third season, and then even after that, you can read it's it's been a repetitive thing that she's gone through some really tough times the last couple of years. But we started seeing the beginning stages of that. Well, what was also happening was Gail was becoming more sensitive. Um, she was feeling things, experiencing things, and all of a sudden she started having walk-ins. And the first walk-in that occurred, of course, was at uh, Hotel Coronado during the Lucille Ball episode, I think it was. Um, the ghost of Kate Morgan kind of entered into Gail, and she started feeling the emotions and stuff that Kate, that Kate felt, felt. But it wasn't until, actually, we're in Lincoln County uh, Courthouse, or um, Essex County store in Lincoln, New Mexico, doing Billy the Kid. We're outside. Gail's smoking a cigarette, and we're taking like a 15-minute break before we film. And I walk over to Gail, and all of a sudden she turns and her eyes change. And she starts talking to me. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She starts talking about things about the town, you know, this and that, and, and this woman. I'm like, who's this woman? She goes, well, you know, the woman that she goes and gets stuff from us for the store and everything. And I'm like, I had no idea what she was talking about. Then all of a sudden... I go, you, you, Gil, you're, you're crazy, you're, you're, you're acting like some crazy girl or something. I was like, she's like, what? She said, I'm not a girl, don't you dare call me a girl. What was happening was Gail was possessed by a 17 or 18 year old boy. And this boy is talking through her. And then the crew is looking at us like, what the heck is going on? And all of a sudden Gail turns and she's back to herself. And she's no, like, what are you guys no. talking about? I'm like, all right, let's just ignore that. But then it happened again, and uh, her boyfriend was a cameraman at the time. And he comes running over to me and says, Chris, we need you. Something's going on. And, and she's sitting there just talking about stuff. And so she grabs my hand. She's like, I want to show you something. She takes me to the front of the place and starts talking about the store, when it was back during the times of Billy the Kid. Oh, my and goodness. She's, and she's like, you know, you know who I am and this and that. And I didn't even put it together. But I, I didn't even know who this was. I was so freaked out by this and worried for her that I didn't, and, they, and the producer was like, didn't want me to start having conversations and, and, and dragging this on. She said, Chris, get her out of it, get her out of it. I said, no, this is important. Luckily, I recorded some of it on my recorder, and I still have a documentation of this. But um, I, 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 to this day, I believe that we may have been actually talking to Billy the Kid, that Billy the Kid was actually possessing Gail. Because what had happened was, when she took my hand, she took me over to the barn. She's like, I want to show you something in the barn. She goes over to the barn, and they open up the barn, and she just stood there in total shock and starts crying. And then all of a sudden, she's out of it, and then it's Gail, and she's like, what am I doing here? And she freaks out, and she runs off screaming, and uh, she had like a little breakdown. But what it was was the spirit of whoever it was had stored stuff in that shed, and the shed was really old. Well... Obviously, from 100 years ago, whatever time period it was, um, a lot's changed since then. So when it was opened, they didn't recognize anything that was in there, and they realized, what's going on here? I know what's in here, but yet it's all different. And then they realized, oh, my God, I'm dead. I'm not supposed to be here, blah, 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 and they shot back out of her body. So it was this this back-and-forth thing that was going on for a couple of days with Gail, with this spirit, and we sat down with the owners, and we started telling them some of the stuff Gail was saying. So they started looking through books, like could Gail have gone through any books that were sitting on the desk about the history of this place? I mean, there was nothing in there that pertained to it. So the one woman that owned the place called a historian or something in the town, and she told them the names, and they're like, oh yeah. And they brought over a book, and this book, the woman she was talking about was a woman that had a lot of money. She used to come into town and go shopping. And for all the kids, she would buy stuff for all the kids in the neighborhood. My God. And and this woman was the woman that Gail was, because Gail said her name. That's you know, we, we had it on the camera, and we, we researched it and found out that there's no way Gail could have known this. So we were just completely blown away. Um, I told him we need to put this on the show. This is amazing. Gail had an experience. We're like, no, Gail's supposed to remain as a skeptic, this and that. And plus, with the things she's dealing with personally, we don't want them to think that she's you know, having a nervous breakdown or this and that. And I fought it and fought it and fought it, and they were adamant we're not putting this in. I said, this is a breakthrough. I'm like, this is huge. So um, that's why that episode means so much to me. But, you know, the fact that we got the, also at the Lincoln County Courthouse where Billy the Kid was captured 
and broke free and shot and killed the deputy and the sheriff. Oh, my God. In Lincoln, New Mexico, huh? Yeah, in Lincoln, New Mexico, and wow. the bullet holes are still there, and the original floor is still there, and the original walls are still there. A lot of what occurred during that time port is still there, which is important because it's like a time capsule. It contains all that place memory, that emotion from the past. And during an EVP session going up and down the stairs, I captured the gunshots. Oh, my goodness. Gunshots, but you hear a voice right after it says, you know, help me, help save me, or something like that. I can't remember. It's been a few years. But what what's ama- help save me. But what's remarkable about that is that is what uh, one of the historians said that the deputy had said or something to, to that fact. But it's all related to that exact spot where he was shot and killed. So I believe we did actually capture the gunshots from Billy the Kid and actually the, uh, the deputy that was shot and killed. That's incredible because I visited uh, uh, the tombstone where he's buried in uh, Fort Sumner. I visited Lincoln and uh, the prison that you're talking about. You still have the bullet hole in the wall, you know, with a little piece of glass in front of it. And uh, down the staircase, actually. How have you been there? The, I've been there uh, maybe about uh, 10 years ago, you know, on a tr- road trip because I'm a big, big Billy the Kid fan and uh, I wanted to experience everything. And I, I, st- I still felt as if he was, you know, at, at the gr- at Tombstone, uh, this Tombstone, you know, where it says Pals in, um, yeah. in Fort Sumner, you know, I felt as if he was standing right with, with us. You know, I, I don't know why I never did it before, but actually he had a beer with him, uh, you know, and I poured, I poured half of the beer for him and I said, hey, here's to you, buddy. That's so cool. And, uh, you know, that was kind of like my, uh, the, the, the start of my uh, paranormal career because I felt as if he was standing right beside me. You know what's remarkable about the Lincoln County Courthouse is that they close around 6 o'clock at night because it's a really tiny town. There's only a few people in the town and people come through there. So they only keep the museum open to like 6, 6 o'clock. And there's no security walking around or anything. They shut everything down. It's a small town. And nobody's in there. After like seven o'clock, nobody, nobody's ever in there after that time. Nobody's ever been in there to investigate that place. So when we went there, we were the first people to ever be there at, at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, ever. Oh my What goodness. was remarkable was I'm upstairs by myself and they let me go up there and I'm recording on digital recorder. I captured a bunch of EVPs of spirits communicating like, who is that? I don't know. You know, and they're making comments about me, some, you know, nasty comments, this and that. And, you know, when I listened to it and analyzed, I was like, oh, my God, they were having complete conversations. And they'd never seen anybody else up there late at night. And they said, well, we're going to mess with them. And they were saying they could do stuff. They never did anything. But I think also because being there that late at night, not having interruptions or anything else, and being one of the first people ever go in there to actually use this type of equipment, that maybe that's why we got so successful with capturing that, that recording. It's the only thing I can think of because when you have this place memory that's recorded there, no different than a DVD or a record player or something else, is when it gets worn down, it's just not as effective. It's not as clean, not as clear. It, you know, it loses some of its original, uh, uh, you know, capture. You know, like a photograph gets older, gets torn up and loses some of the image. You know, the vinyl records get scratched and stuff like that. I think it's, maybe that's, that's possibly the same thing is that, you know, if you started building upon it and changing things and people coming through, it loses the originality of what really occurred there. And it's no longer able to obtain it or connect with it. That's that's so true. You know, Chris, we'll, we'll take a five-minute break and be back on part two of the, uh, of the podcast. It's been amazing. You know, we could go on for hours. <laughs> so we'll take a five-minute break, and uh, we'll be back uh, on the podcast. Okay. 